Millions believe God exists. Few have proof or even no proof exists. Have you proven God exists? Or do you hope, suspect, feel, believe, think he does? Can his existence be scientifically proven? Can you know with certainty that an all-intelligent mind created the universe and all life on earth, including you? Must the answers be accepted on faith? This series covers the existence of God and will be among the most important you ever watch. In under two hours, you will see it is impossible for God not to exist. Not just improbable or that the case is strong. Impossible. All doubt of his existence will vanish. You will also see how God describes atheists. This series squarely faces basic questions. To those with an open mind, it will be life-changing. The World to Come. The Restored Church of God presents David C. Pack, author of 80 books and booklets, editor in chief of The Real Truth magazine, read by countless and growing numbers in every nation and territory of the world. In a violent age full of war, famine, pollution, disease, disasters, and economic uncertainty, and ever worsening bad news. Answering life's greatest questions straight from the Bible and announcing the wonderful good news of the world to come. And now, David C. Pack. People have debated the existence of God for thousands of years. Most conclude it cannot be proven one way or the other. The majority think the answer lies in abstract philosophy and the metaphysical. Others become agnostics, asserting they don't know if God exists. Those who do accept his existence often do so passively, merely because they were taught it from childhood. Some don't care. Many of these cannot be moved from their apathy. Atheists, having concluded God does not exist, represent a special category God describes. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. You will learn why God twice calls atheists fools. Almost 50 years ago, I learned of absolute proof God exists. My studies lasted two and a half years. I came to realize I did not have to accept his existence on faith. Science has learned much more, and the case for God is now airtight. This broadcast begins presenting numerous absolute proofs God does exist. Some proofs will amaze you, others will inspire you, still others will surprise or even excite you. All of them will fascinate you with their simplicity. You will soon never again doubt God's existence. In fact, just part one will convince you. We will first examine some traditional proofs and then consider material at the cutting edge of scientific proof before returning to older proofs. We will explore astronomy, biology, chemistry, and mathematics. A second great question is unavoidable and inseparable from the question of God's existence. Whether there is life on earth because of blind, dumb luck through evolution or because of special creation by a supreme being. Did all life on earth evolve over millions of years as evolutionists assert? Or did an all-powerful God author it? Most people assume evolution is true just as millions assume God's existence. I also studied evolution versus creation in depth during the same period I sought to prove God's existence. I learned it takes far more faith to believe the intellectually fashionable evolutionary myth than that God exists. In fact, I learned evolution is based entirely on faith because no true facts or proof have ever been found to support it. We offer an eye-opening, powerful, and inspiring brochure, Evolution, Facts, Fallacies, and Implications, that complements this series. Those who read it will never again doubt the scientific case for creation or the silliness of evolution. Faith does play a role in the life of a Christian. For the one who truly wants to see God and learn to please Him, notice... Without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he that comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Faith is vital to a Christian. 
you saw that without it no one can please God. This verse says those seeking God must believe that He is. But a deep belief in a God who rewards all who diligently seek Him requires proof of His existence. Only after proof has been nailed down can one have faith, absolute confidence that what he does is being recorded in God's mind to be remembered when he receives his reward. If you are uncertain God exists because proof has not been firmly established, under fire your faith will wane or collapse, I promise. The Apostle Paul wrote, Though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things. Howbeit there is not in every man that knowledge. The religions of this world have created many gods of wood, stone, and other materials. Others exist only in the minds of men. The ancient Greeks alone served 30,000 gods, and modern Hindus worship 5 million gods. Truly, there are and always have been God's many and Lord's many. Yet God created all the physical materials men use to design and make their own gods. Sadly, there is not in every man knowledge of the true God. Such incredible ignorance and confusion. The Bible's God has shown the way to peace, happiness, and abundant life for all people willing to study His instruction book. This would rid mankind of the confusion and evils that encompass this world. Of course, some don't want this God to exist because if He does, they must obey Him. Be willing to accept science. As we reason, do not suppose or hope. Stand on indisputable facts. We will see them from a broad array of different kinds of science. They will demonstrate that an all-powerful supreme being of infinite intelligence carefully provided more than sufficient proof to remove all doubt he exists. Now, before starting this study, remember, assumptions don't count. Neither do superstitious myths or traditions based on ignorance. What can be known from science? Only accept facts. Think rationally and clearly. Then accept what can be proven. The following excerpts are from a Wall Street Journal article, Science Increasingly Makes the Case for God. It demonstrates why it is impossible for God not to exist. It's long, but powerful. It begins, In 1966, Time magazine ran a cover story asking, Is God Dead? I Remember It. Many have accepted the cultural narrative that He's obsolete that as science progresses, there is less need for a god to explain the universe. The relatively recent case for his existence comes from a surprising place, science itself. The same year Time featured the now famous headline, the astronomer Carl Sagan announced that there were two important criteria for a planet to support life, the right kind of star and the right distance from that star. Given the roughly octillion, one followed by 27 zeros, planets in the universe, there should have been about septillion, one followed by 24 zeros, planets capable of supporting life. With such spectacular odds, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, a large expensive collection of private and publicly funded projects launched in the 1960s was sure to turn up something soon. Scientists listened with a vast radio telescopic network for signals that resembled coded intelligence and were not merely random. But as years passed, the silence from the rest of the universe was deafening. As of 2014, researchers have discovered precisely nothing. This is already an enormous statement. Take it in before we continue. As our knowledge of the universe increased, it became clear that there were far more factors necessary for life than Sagan supposed. His two parameters grew to 10, and then 20, and then 50. And so the number of potentially life-supporting planets decreased accordingly. The number dropped and kept on plummeting. As factors continued to be discovered, the number of possible planets hit zero and kept going. 
In other words, the odds turned against any planet in the universe supporting life, including this one. Probability said that even we, Earth, shouldn't be here. Today there are more than 200 known parameters necessary for a planet to support life, every single one of which must be perfectly met or the whole thing falls apart. Without a massive planet like Jupiter nearby, for instance, whose gravity will draw away asteroids, a thousand times as many would hit Earth's surface. The odds against life in the universe are simply astonishing. Grasp what you are reading. Can every one of those many parameters have been perfect by accident? At what point is it fair to admit that science suggests we cannot be the result of random forces? Doesn't assuming that an intelligence created these perfect conditions require far less faith than believing a life-sustaining Earth just happened to beat the inconceivable odds to come into being? The article continues showing more proof of a god, including experts whose atheism is greatly shaken, it says, by recent developments. The fine-tuning necessary for life to exist on a planet is nothing compared with the fine-tuning required for the universe to exist at all. For example, astrophysicists now know that the values of the four fundamental forces, gravity, the electromagnetic force, and the strong and weak nuclear forces, were determined less than one millionth of a second after the Big Bang alter any one value and the universe could not exist. For instance, if the ratio between the nuclear strong force and the electromagnetic force had been off by the tiniest fraction of the tiniest fraction by even one part in 100 followed by 15 zeros, then no stars could have ever formed at all. Stunning. Multiply that single parameter by all the other necessary conditions and the odds against the universe existing are so heart-stoppingly astronomical that the notion that it all just happened defies common sense. It would be like tossing a coin and having it come up heads ten quintillion times in a row. Fred Hoyle, the astronomer who coined the term Big Bang, said his atheism was greatly shaken at these developments. He later wrote that a common sense interpretation of the facts suggests a super intellect has monkeyed with the physics as well as with chemistry and biology. The numbers one calculates from the facts seem to me so overwhelming as to put this conclusion almost beyond question. Theoretical physicist Paul Davies has said that the appearance of design is overwhelming. And Oxford professor Dr. John Lennox has said the more we get to know about our universe, the more the hypothesis that there is a creator gains in credibility as the best explanation of why we are here. You probably have a watch. Without it, you would be lost in a world that demands people be on time. Some watches are more accurate than others. How accurate is yours? How long before it loses one second? Periodically, you adjust it by reckoning from a more accurate source. Whatever the source, it is also imperfect and has to be regularly updated, though not as often, to be in accord with the master clock of the United States at the Naval Observatory in Washington, D.C., until 1967, naval astronomers observed the Earth's motion in relation to the heavens to accurately measure time. All U.S. clocks were set in relation to these precise measurements. It was God who made this master clock of the universe. He set the heavens in motion and man learned to use its wonderful accuracy. But God's great clock holds more marvels. In 1968, scientists built an atomic clock that uses cesium-133 atoms because they vibrate at the rate of 9,192,631,770 times per second. This is accurate to within one second every 30 million years. Imagine your watch was that accurate. Cesium-133 atoms never vary a single vibration. They are steady constant, reliable, and cannot be an accident of nature that just happens to always turn out exactly the same.
God had to design the complexity and reliability of these atoms. No honest mind can believe otherwise. Men merely learn to capture what God designed for use in time measurement. Doubters consider this. Scientists at the National Institute of Standards and Technology in Colorado have built an optical clock even more accurate by measuring time with light. Time is now measured in what are called femtoseconds, or a million billionth of a second. These clocks use mercury ions at their heart to count the number of times they vibrate in a second. Optical frequencies consistently oscillate at one million billion, or one quadrillion, times per second. By using lasers and cooled down mercury ions, scientists have harnessed God's precision to better measure time. Optical clocks only slip by one second every 30 billion years. This is 1,000 times more accurate than atomic clocks. As with the movement of the heavens, men have learned to capture the reliability of cesium-133 atoms and the movement of cooled mercury ions to count time with oscillations per second that never vary. Could such perfect order really be the result of an accident? With great time and effort, the world's finest watchmakers can at best devise relatively imprecise clocks. Can any fair-minded person believe the three highly precise clocks, the heavens, atomic, and optical clocks, came by chance? Are we to believe that very sophisticated, humanly devised watches required the effort and ingenuity of skilled, intelligent men to create them? But clocks of far greater sophistication, precision, and design developed on their own? How utterly foolish to believe. You've seen absolute proof only the greatest watchmaker, God, could have devised these greatest watches. What is the truth of modern science regarding the origin of all matter in the universe? Do scientists claim it has always existed? Or have they determined there was a moment in time when all matter came into existence? The latter answer is yes. But what is the proof? The first law of thermodynamics is matter and energy can be neither created nor destroyed. No natural processes can alter either matter or energy in this way. This means there is no new matter or energy coming into existence and no matter or energy passing out of existence. Saying the universe came into existence from nothing violates the first law of thermodynamics, established by the very scientific community now willing to ignore it. This law plainly demonstrates that the universe and all matter and energy within it must have had a divine origin, a specific moment in which it was created by someone all-powerful. With the discovery of radium in 1898 by Madame Curie, came the knowledge that all radioactive elements continually give off radiation. Consider, uranium has an atomic weight of 238. As it decomposes, it releases a helium atom three times. Each helium atom has a weight of four. Now at 226, uranium becomes radium. Radium continues giving off additional atoms until eventually the end product becomes the heavy inert element, lead. This takes a tremendous amount of time. Just radium becoming lead requires 1,590 years. What's the point? There was a time when uranium could not have existed because it always breaks down in a highly systematic and controlled way. Not stable like lead or other elements, uranium breaks down. So there was a specific moment when all radioactive elements came into existence. Remember, all of them, uranium, radium, thorium, radon, polonium, protactinium, and others have not existed forever. This represents absolute proof that matter came into existence. In other words, matter has not always existed. This flies directly in the face of evolutionary thought, that everything gradually evolved into something else. The problem? You cannot have something slowly come into existence from nothing. Matter could not have come into existence by itself.
No rational person could possibly believe the entire universe, including all radioactive elements, that proved there was a specific time of beginning gradually came into existence by itself. Try to build something, anything, from nothing. Even with your creative power engaged in the effort, you would never be able. You cannot, in a hundred lifetimes of trying, produce a single thing from nothing. Can any doubter believe everything in the entirety of the universe, in all its exquisite detail, came into existence completely by itself? Be honest, again, accept facts. This is proof that the natural physical realm demands the existence of a great creator. The second law of thermodynamics is best summarized by saying everything moves toward disorder, a condition known as entropy. This bears some explanation. Remember, evolutionists teach that everything is constantly evolving into a higher and more complex order. They believe things continue to get better and better instead of worse and worse. If water on a stove is at 150 degrees Fahrenheit and the burner is turned off, the temperature drops instead of rises. It moves toward colder, not hotter. Balls on hills always roll down, not up. Energy to perform any task changes from usable to unusable during the task. It will always go from a higher energy level to a lower one, where less and less energy is available. Applied to the universe, the second law of thermodynamics reveals that the universe is winding down, moving toward disorder, entropy, not winding up, or moving toward more perfect order and structure. In short, the entire universe is slowing down. Even evolutionists admit that the theory of evolution and this law are completely incompatible. Notice. Regarding the second law of thermodynamics, universally accepted scientific law, which states that all things left to themselves will tend to run down, or the law of entropy, it is observed it would hardly be possible to conceive of two more completely opposite principles than this principle of entropy increase and the principle of evolution. Each is precisely the converse of the other. As Aldous Huxley defined it, evolution involves a continual increase of order, of organization, of size, of complexity. It seems axiomatic that both cannot possibly be true. But there is no question whatever that the second law of thermodynamics is true. Like a top or a yo-yo, the universe must have been wound up. Since it is constantly winding down, the second law of thermodynamics begs a great question. Who wound it up? The only plausible answer, God. We have established that creation demands a creator. Now some amazing scientific proofs of creation. Evolution is shot full of inconsistencies. Evolutionists have seized on many theories within the overall theory in an attempt to explain the origins of plants, animals, the heavens, and the earth. Over and over, these theorists try to explain how life evolved from inanimate material into more complex life forms until reaching the pinnacle, human beings. Yet, as one geologist wrote, it must be significant that nearly all the evolutionary stories I learned as a student have been debunked. The biggest reason so many theories within the overall theory of evolution collapse is because they contain terrible logic requiring great leaps in faith to believe. Here is one example of a debunked theory. Many evolutionists have tried to argue that humans are 99% similar chemically to apes and blood precipitation tests do indicate that the chimpanzee is people's closest relative. Yet regarding this, we must observe the following. Milk chemistry indicates that the donkey is man's closest relative. Cholesterol level tests indicate that the garter snake is man's closest relative. Tear enzyme chemistry indicates that the chicken is man's closest relative. On the basis of another type of blood chemistry test, the butter bean is man's closest relative. More people should weep for evolutionists. Let's consider the incredible complexity of life. Everyone has witnessed explosions. Have you ever seen one that was orderly? Or one that created a watch or a clock? 
or a single thing of exquisite design instead of chaos and destruction. If you threw a million hand grenades, you would see them produce chaos and destruction a million times. There would never be an exception. Consider the next quotes involving the likelihood of an explosion creating the entire natural realm of life on earth, let alone the beautiful magnificence and order seen no matter how far one looks into space. Dr. B. G. Ranganathan said, The probability of life originating from accident is comparable to the unabridged dictionary resulting from an explosion in a printing shop. And this only speaks to the likelihood of any life at all, rather than the most highly complex forms such as large animals or human beings. What of all the millions of kinds of life existing today? The English professor of astronomy at Cambridge University, Sir Fred Hoyle, also stated, The chance that higher forms have emerged in this way is comparable with the chance that a tornado sweeping through a junkyard might assemble a Boeing 747 from the materials therein. Consider the common mouse trap. Everyone is familiar with it, and most have used one. Which part of a mouse trap could you remove and it would still work? The answer, none. While ingenious, it is still a very simple mechanism. Since the mousetrap cannot be made any simpler, it represents a condition called irreducible complexity. Certain living organisms also cannot be simplified or reduced in complexity and survive. The removal of any one part causes the system to cease functioning. Irreducibly complex systems cannot be produced gradually by slight successive modifications from a less complicated precondition. They must exist exactly as they are, whole, complete, or they cannot exist at all. Take away any part and they cease to function and therefore to live. What are the implications of this? Charles Darwin, in his famous work, The Origin of Species, framed a giant problem for him and all evolutionists. If it could be demonstrated, he wrote, that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. Those are his words. Yet nature contains endless biochemical systems that cannot be reduced in complexity. They are sometimes referred to as molecular machines and, like a four-stroke gas engine, cannot be simplified and still function. The next part of this series will continue examining irreducible complexity and more powerful proof of the existence of God. There is much more evidence coming. In the meantime, request our free booklet, Does God Exist? Until next time, this is David C. Pack saying goodbye, friends. This program was made available by Restored Church of God members and donors from around the globe. Explore our vast library of literature and other world-to-come programs, which are all made available free of charge. To order literature featured in this program, Call toll-free 1-855-828-4646. That number again, 1-855-828-4646. Atheists deny God exists. Agnostics declare it can't be known. Most who accept God's existence also believe there is no proof of it. This is part two of five covering proof that God exists. His existence need not be taken on faith. Many just do not realize that science conclusively proves the existence of God. Any true God would never leave his creation, mankind, in doubt about whether he exists. Despite widespread controversy, you can know with absolute certainty that an all-intelligent mind created the universe and all life on earth. Part one brought evidence from astronomy, biology, chemistry, and mathematics. Now comes even more stunning, yet largely little-known, proofs. Some lengthy quotes will appear, but they are all worth the time taken because after completing this series, your belief in God will stand on bedrock. 
the world to come. The Restored Church of God presents David C. Pack, author of 80 books and booklets, editor-in-chief of The Real Truth magazine, read by countless and growing numbers in every nation and territory of the world, in a violent age full of bad news, answering life's greatest questions straight from the Bible and announcing the wonderful good news of the world to come. And now, David C. Pack. We pick up where we left off with the concept of irreducible complexity. Recall that Charles Darwin himself wrote in The Origin of Species, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. You will see that Darwin would today say his theory has failed, utterly. Its many breakdowns mean it cannot be true. He would say this, Sadly, he's not here to tell us to drop his theory that it's false. If only people would believe Charles Darwin's own rules governing his ideas. No one would believe evolution. Back from the grave, he would be the first to disown the theory of evolution. We start with an example of molecular machines to better appreciate the complexity of cells. Japanese and German scientists have now discovered the smallest of nature's machines called tiny engines. Advanced research on these remarkable super small engines of life begs the question, where did they come from? A group of Japanese scientists exploring the crystal structure of F1 ATP ACE enzyme discovered nature's own rotary engine, no bigger than 10 billionths by 10 billionths by 8 billionths of a meter. The tiny motor includes the equivalent of an engine block, drive shaft, and three pistons. It runs at speeds between one half and four revolutions per second. This motor not only ranks as the smallest ever seen, it also represents the smallest motor that the laws of physics and chemistry will allow. In Germany, a research team used new instruments to examine an enormous molecule, the yeast 26S protosome. Though not the largest molecule in existence, this one contains over 2 million protons and neutrons and is the largest non-symmetrical molecule mapped to date. This molecule can only be described as a wonder. It serves as an intracellular waste disposal and recycling system. Recognize such an organism could never have evolved gradually. This is literally impossible. Now another amazing quote about a single truly incredible organism. It is necessarily long to illustrate the complexity of just one molecular machine. This fascinating understanding about your body is more than worth the time taken to read it. In many biological structures, proteins are simply components of larger molecular machines. Like the picture tube, wires, metal bolts, and screws that comprise a television, many proteins are part of structures that only function when virtually all of the components have been assembled. A good example of this is a cilium. Cilia are hair-like organelles on the surfaces of many animal and lower plant cells that serve to move fluid over the cell's surface or to row single cells through a fluid. In humans, for example, epithelial cells lining the respiratory tract each have about 200 cilia that beat in synchrony to sweep mucus towards the throat for elimination. Already amazing, we're just warming up. A cilium consists of a membrane-coated bundle of fibers called an axoneme. An axoneme contains a ring of nine double microtubules surrounding two central single microtubules. Each outer doublet consists of a ring of 13 filaments, subfiber A, fused to an assembly of 10 filaments, subfiber B. The filaments of the microtubules are composed of two proteins called alpha and beta tubulin. The 11 microtubules forming an axoneme are held together by three types of connectors. Subfibers A are joined to the central microtubules by radial spokes. 
adjacent outer doublets are joined by linkers that consist of a highly elastic protein called nexin. And the central microtubules are joined by a connecting bridge. Finally, every subfiber A bears two arms, an inner arm and an outer arm, both containing the protein dynein. But how does a cilium work? The fascination grows greater. Experiments have indicated that the ciliary motion results from the chemically powered walking of the dynean arms on one microtubule up the neighboring subfiber B of a second microtubule so that the two microtubules slide past each other. However, the protein crosslinks between microtubules in an intact cilium prevent neighboring microtubules from sliding past each other by more than a short distance. These crosslinks convert the dynean-induced sliding motion to a bending motion of the entire axonine. Now let us sit back, review the workings of the cilium, and consider what it implies. Cilia are composed of at least a half dozen proteins. Alpha tubulin, beta tubulin, dynean, nexin, spoke protein, and a central bridge protein. These combine to perform one task, ciliary motion. And all of these proteins must be present for the cilium to function. If the tubulins are absent, then there are no filaments to slide. If the dynean is missing, then the cilium remains rigid and motionless. If nexin or the other connecting proteins are missing, then the axoneme falls apart when the filaments slide. What we see in the cilium, then, is not just profound complexity, but also irreducible complexity on the molecular scale. This was terribly complicated, but that's the point. All of this evolved by blind, dumb luck? On this alone, no wonder God declares, the fool has said, there is no God. But should not even fools doubt this could happen? Organisms are all complicated, some wonderfully so, and yet they cannot be reduced, diminished, or simplified in complexity. They had to come into being exactly as they are because they never could have arrived at their present condition gradually. We should stand in awe of any god great enough just to design and create cilia. Let's now journey deep into the cells of all living organisms. This will be unlike any trip you have ever taken. There appears a world of such exquisite detail, design, complexity, interdependence, and specificity as to boggle the mind. Let's start painting. A brief discussion of proteins and sequencing is necessary. To form a protein, amino acids must link together to form a chain. Amino acids form functioning proteins only when they adopt very specific sequential arrangements, like properly sequenced letters in an English sentence. Thus, amino acids alone do not make proteins any more than letters alone make poetry. In both cases, the sequencing of the constituent parts determines the function of the whole. Explaining the origin of the specific sequencing of proteins and DNA lies at the heart of the current crisis in materialistic evolutionary thinking. Proteins must appear in exact sequences to cause specific chemical reactions or build specific structures within the cells. This action is called specificity. It is because of specificity that proteins cannot substitute for one another. They are as different in purpose as an axe, drill, hammer, or screwdriver. Let's summarize the enormous difficulty of believing DNA happened by chance. The complexity and intricacy of the DNA molecule, combined with the staggering amount of chemically coded information it contains, speaks unerringly to the fact that this super molecule simply could not have happened by blind chance. It is not possible for a code of any kind to arise by chance or accident. A code is the work of an intelligent mind. Even the cleverest dog or chimpanzee could not work out a code of any kind. It is obvious, then, that chance cannot do it. This could no more have been the work of chance or accident than could the Moonlight Sonata be played by mice running up and down the keyboard of my piano. Codes do not arise from chaos.
Now another source. Atheist Richard Dawkins has admitted the more statistically improbable a thing is, the less we can believe it just happened by blind chance. Superficially, the obvious alternative to chance is an intelligent designer. The source book later states, that is the very point the theist is stressing. An intelligent designer is demanded by the available evidence. The famous Dr. Carl Sagan wrote about DNA. The information content of a simple cell has been estimated as around 10 to the 12th power, or 1 trillion bits. He put this number into perspective. That if one were to count every letter of every word of every book in the world's largest library over 10 million volumes, the final tally would be approximately a trillion letters. Thus, a single cell contains the equivalent information content of more than 10 million volumes. Nothing works unless everything works at the same time. DNA could not have gradually come into existence. Special creation is required, required for DNA to exist. Where did all life on earth come from? How did it get here? The Bible declares that God created all living things during the first six days of the creation week. Is this true, or did life appear by itself? As with uranium-238 in its provable moment of beginning, the great pattern of all life is that it can only come from pre-existing life. This is called the law of biogenesis. Every first-year biology student knows it. When examining tiny organisms like protozoa and bacteria, it can be demonstrated that life only comes from life. There are many kinds of life, but each continues to reproduce the same kind over and over. This is indisputable. Life can never come from non-living objects. Biologists know that all cells can only come from pre-existing cells. Evolutionists theorize that inanimate objects, under certain unknown circumstances in the misty past, as they like to assert, somehow spontaneously gave birth to primitive life forms. But this presents enormous problems for anyone familiar with the nature and complexity of simple cells. Even the most rudimentary cells are extremely complex. The simplest organism capable of independent life, the prokaryote bacterial cell, is a masterpiece of miniaturized complexity which makes a spaceship seem rather low-tech. Here's another source. The cell needs all its basic parts with their various functions for survival. Therefore, if the cell had evolved, it would have meant that billions of parts would have had to come into existence at the same time, in the same place, and then simultaneously come together in a precise order. Skeptics ignore the truth that it is impossible to have life without a life giver. Only God has life inherent in himself. This is what makes him God. No one created God. But is he merely a blind power? A dumb first force? Just complexity screams no. The first law of thermodynamics points to a creator's eternal existence. Remember, this law says something cannot come from nothing. Thus, a creator had to always exist. Science has effectively proven that if there were not an eternal God being to create the universe, there could never have been a universe. Since a cause must be greater than the effect, a maker, an all-powerful God, had to exist through eternity to effect the creation. Science has unwittingly demonstrated God's existence while simultaneously debunking evolution. A Nobel Prize winning physicist stated, The progress of science, no matter how marvelous it appears to be, leads to dead ends and shows our final ineptitude of producing a rational explanation of the universe. Let's add an also a rational explanation for plants, animals, and human beings. Instead of looking for the truth of creation, science has chosen confusion, suppositions, and deceit. Ignoring the evidence, evolutionists and others are forced to conjure illusions, which should be getting easier to see for what they are. But why would highly intelligent men believe such false and silly ideas and even willingly deceive people into doing the same? 
get this, they do not want a God telling them what to do. They cannot have that. In their world, God must not exist. They want you to agree because like misery, darkness also loves company. Christ's listeners saw he spoke with authority. So do I. Speaking truth with facts allows this. And we do this on all subjects of plain Bible truth. Stop and think of all the works of nature around you, on earth and in the heavens. First, consider the many kinds of planets, stars, and galaxies. Each is its own marvel. Second, consider all species of plants on earth. There are millions, diverse in color, shape, size, beauty, and length of life. I've spent much of my life studying and working with many kinds of plants. The brilliance of their varying designs and purposes never ceases to amaze me. A side note should be considered. All existing food on earth is perfectly designed for human or animal consumption. It is constructed to contain just the right amounts of differing elements necessary to sustain various life forms. Every time man tries to improve or alters food, he pollutes, ruins, devitalizes, injects with poison, genetically re-engineers, or in some manner reduces its perfection into something inferior to what he started with. If mankind would just leave food alone and eat it as God created, sickness, disease, and every form of nutrition-related infirmity would disappear. The germination, growth, development, and maturation of plants into the many kinds of food available just to human beings represents its own series of miracles far too complex to recount here. It would command its own book just to explore beyond the most superficial overview. Now think hard. Who is more intelligent? God, who made perfect food, or men, who find every possible way to alter and degrade it before consuming it? Third, consider the over one million different kinds of animals, plus the estimated 12 million kinds of insects. Because these creatures are animate, they are even more marvelous and fascinating than our plants. But their diversity in color, shape, size, beauty, and lifespan is much like plants. The point? As fascinating, marvelous, beautiful, and amazing as are all the things described here, nothing is as amazing as the human mind. It is the absolute pinnacle of all living organisms. None can doubt this. Think of what man has been able to produce. He can build houses, make smartphones, trains, automobiles, planes, rockets, computers, and other sophisticated devices that are almost limitless in complexity and usefulness. Yet man's creative genius has a limit. No man or group of men can create anything as marvelous as the human mind. Everything man creates is inferior to his own mind. Try thinking of one thing that has ever been created by men that is superior to the minds who created it. You will fail. Here is the question. Who or what created your mind? And you. King David stated, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Surely this is most true of the human brain. Be honest. Can you possibly believe some kind of blind, dumb power or force of no intelligence, way below that of men, created your mind? Remember, you can create nothing superior to your mind. So only a greater mind could create your mind. Don't insult yourself. Don't suggest your extraordinary creative powers of intelligence, reason, logic, thought, volition, and ingenuity are a product of dumb luck. Take time to read our free eye-opening booklet, What Science Will Never Discover About Your Mind. And also request another, Does God Exist? Evolutionists once referred more often to evidence from the fossil record. Does such evidence exist? Do bones and artifacts from millions of years ago tell a story, offer convincing proof that man evolved from simple organisms? What says the scientific record? Remember, we want facts, proof, not theories requiring faith to believe them. In the 1920s, a single tooth was found in western Nebraska at Snake Creek Quarry. 
Scientists offered this tooth as proof evolution had occurred and purported it to be a missing link. Because of where it was found, the human-like sketch drawn around it was called Nebraska Man. Much to do was made of this discovery. It was big news. Evolutionists rejoiced. But a funny thing happened on the way to proof of evolution. Five years later, someone decided to ask a farmer his opinion of the tooth. His answer? It's a pig's tooth. More excavation at the site proved the rest of the skeleton was indeed a pig. It is often bones or just bone fragments, many of which have been determined to be hoaxes, that cause evolutionists to assert that important links from the fossil record have been found. Merely because someone found a piece of bone, sophisticated artist renderings are presented, given names, and offered as convincing visual proof that evolution occurred. Poppycock. Horse man was based on what turned out to be the skull cap of a donkey. Ramapithecus man was simply a baboon skull. Piltdown man was an outright hoax, and Neanderthal man was later determined to be severely bow-legged because he had rickets. He was not proof from the fossil record of a half-ape, half-man transitional creature. There is a certain desperation in the thinking and actions of many evolutionary scientists. The next quotes demonstrate their approach. A five million year old piece of bone that was thought to be the collarbone of a human-like creature is actually part of a dolphin rib. Anthropologist Dr. Tim White stated, the problem with a lot of anthropologists is that they want so much to find a hominid, human, that any scrap of bone becomes a hominid bone. This comes from a professor of physics. In fact, Evolution became, in a sense, a scientific religion. Almost all scientists have accepted it, and many are prepared to bend their observations to fit in with it. Let's summarize. No transitional forms exist anywhere in the fossil record. While evolutionists will suggest it took 50 million years for a fish to evolve into an amphibian, the simple truth is there are no transitional fossils to prove it. There are no creatures found that evidence partial fins, partial feet, or partially evolved brains, legs, eyes, organs, or other body parts. Even Darwin, the father of evolution, admitted, why, if species have descended from other species by insensibly fine gradations, do we not everywhere see innumerable transitional forms. Why is not all nature in confusion instead of the species being, as we see them, well defined? This is an example of why Darwin would himself say his theory is false and why he would be the first to disown it in light of what science has learned. Let's see how bone fragments are supposed to represent entire human skeletons within various stages of the fossil record. Dr. Richard Leakey, considered the most famous fossil anthropologist in the world, said the skull of his famous discovery, Lucy, is so incomplete that it is mostly imagination made of plaster of Paris. He admitted no firm conclusions could be made about what species she was, even though she was assigned the age of three and a half to four million years old. I have personally seen a photograph of her supposed skeleton and its meaningless. The front cover of a well-known national news magazine showed a picture of an ape's head in an article titled, How Apes Became Human. The article was an outright pitiful attempt to connect a toe bone to other bones found 10 miles away and then to depict them as proof of evolution. Of course, the article speaks of evolution as a foregone conclusion. It was filled with uncertain phrases, however, like close to answering what appears to be. People have speculated. We are suggesting. Still something of a mystery. Probably, about, presumably, and maybe. These phrases are endless. Yet mere artwork and diagrams make the flimsy speculative evidence look like absolute proof. The reader is left with the impression the writers were themselves uncertain and uncomfortable. Mixed with baseless assumptions, the artwork lends credibility through sensationalism, giving it saleability. In the end, it was false advertising in blatant form. 
grasp this. There are no links from plants to animals, reptiles to birds and mammals, etc. The fossil record shows that animals appear suddenly. When this was recognized, the whole theory of microevolution collapsed, and evolutionists admitted as much. They then decided that possibly the fossil record could best be described as indicating macroevolution, sometimes referred to as punctuated equilibrium or the hopeful monster theory. This ludicrous idea suggests a reptile could suddenly lay an egg that would hatch a bird. Of course, since this would be a miracle, it would require God to perform it. But evolutionists can't have that. So evolutionists should probably best be thought of as believing in godless miracles. Now that's a religion worth avoiding. If I sound like I'm mocking them, it's because I am. Any who mock God's existence surely believe we should at least have license to mock them. Their teaching is a disgrace and they embarrass themselves saying they believe it. Don't you believe them? So many are willing to fall for ridiculous ideas because they've been told them throughout their lives, such as, evolution is a fact. They then assume it cannot be wrong if everyone believes it. One source admitted that living things are suited for their environment better explains the fact that they were created for it, not that they evolved into it. After all is said and done, the fossil record has never revealed what evolutionists hoped for. It gives distinct evidence of one fact, sudden special creation of all life in a fully formed condition. To believe anything else is to be dishonest with the evidence. Part 3 reveals many more proofs of God's existence. Don't miss it. Until next time, this is David C. Pack saying goodbye, friends. This program was made available by Restored Church of God members and donors from around the globe. Explore our vast library of literature and other World to Come programs, which are all made available free of charge. To order literature featured in this program, call toll-free 1-855-828-4646. That number again, 1-855-828-4646. The question of God's existence invokes a long controversy, but in the proper light of science, anyone can see the truth. Part 3 brings more incredible proofs from the natural world. While supposed experts claim all life gradually evolved after the Big Bang, you will see additional powerful evidence that everything around us could never be the product of cosmic accident, nor could it have evolved. Many examples reflect God's creative genius. They bear astonishing testimony to divine creation. Each of these miracles of engineering defies atheists and evolutionists. As you see some longer quotes, think carefully about the examples involved. Ask if even one could have evolved. The World to Come The Restored Church of God presents David C. Pack, author of 80 books and booklets, editor-in-chief of The Real Truth magazine, read by countless and growing numbers in every nation and territory of the world, in a violent age full of bad news, answering life's greatest questions straight from the Bible and announcing the wonderful good news of the world to come. And now, David C. Pack. First is the human eye. This amazing mechanism is spectacularly complex and an inspiring testimony to God's supreme intelligence. Three statements from one source represent the magnitude of difficulty in the human eye evolving to its extraordinary complexity. The most amazing component of the eye, as a camera, is its film or retina. This light-sensitive layer, which lines the back of the eyeball, is thinner than a sheet of saran wrap and is vastly more sensitive to a wider range of light than any man-made film. The best man-made film can handle a range of 1,000 to 1 in sensitivity. 
By comparison, the human retina can handle the dynamic range of light of 10 billion to 1 or 10 million times more and can sense as little as a single photon of light in the dark. In bright daylight, the retina bleaches out and turns its volume control way down so as not to overload. The light-sensitive cells of the retina are like an extremely complex high-gain amplifier. There are over 10 million such cells in the retina, and they are packed together with a density of 200,000 per millimeter in the highly sensitive fovea. These photoreceptor cells have a very high rate of metabolism and must completely replace themselves about every seven days. If you look at a very bright light such as the sun, they immediately burn out but are rapidly replaced in most cases. Because the retina is thinner than the wavelength of visible light, it is totally transparent. Each of these minute photoreceptor cells is vastly more complex than the most sophisticated man-made computer. Evolutionary biologist Dr. Ernst Mayer, considered the Darwin of the 20th century, once said, It is a considerable strain on one's credulity to assume that finely balanced systems, such as certain sense organs, the eye of vertebrates, or the bird's feather, could be improved by random mutations. Charles Darwin said the very thought of the eye's complexity gave him chills. Here is why. It has been estimated that 10 billion calculations occur every second in the retina before the light image even gets to the brain. It is sobering to compare this performance to the most powerful man-made computer. In an article published in the computer magazine Byte, Dr. John Stevens said, to simulate 10 milliseconds of the complete processing of even a single nerve cell from the retina would require the solution of about 500 simultaneous nonlinear differential equations 100 times and would take at least several minutes of processing time on a Cray supercomputer. Keeping in mind that there are 10 million or more such cells interacting with each other in complex ways, it would take a minimum of 100 years of cray time to simulate what takes place in your eye many times every second. Modern computers would only barely improve this. Now this, from an article, Does the Human Eye Prove That God Exists? In very basic form, the eye is thought to have first developed in animals about 550 million years ago. But such is its perfect design, its infinite adaptability, and irreducible complexity that many argue it is proof of the divine itself. In Origin of Species, Darwin remarked that the whole idea of something so flawless could have been formed by natural selection seems... I freely confess, he said, absurd in the highest degree. The eye has become a focal point for biologists, ophthalmologists, physicists, and many other branches of science ever since. So when a Spanish neuroscientist made the first anatomical diagrams of neurons in the retina in 1900, it stoked a century of biologists attempting to unlock the eye's secrets. There have been several discoveries. Unlike our ears and nose, for example, which never stop growing our entire lives, our eyes remain the same size from birth. Then there's the complicated process of irrigation, lubrication, cleaning, and protection that happens every time we blink, an average of 4.2 million times a year. There are other astonishing inbuilt systems, too. For example, a little trick called the vestibulo-ocular reflex VOR. In short, it's our own personal steady cam, an inbuilt muscular response that stabilizes everything we see by making tiny imperceptible eye movements in the opposite direction to where our head is moving. Without VOR, any attempts at walking, running, even the minuscule head tremors you make while you read these words would make our vision blurred, scattered, and impossible to comprehend. A huge amount is known about optics and the muscles around the eyes, says Claire O'Connell, an MIT fellow. But the retina is the great unknown territory. It's one of the most complex tissues in the human body.
You are left to draw your own conclusions about how such a marvelous organism could have evolved. No wonder my optometrist told me he believes the eye did not evolve. He knew it could not, but rather was invented by the greatest inventor. After thousands of years, scientists only recently discovered the reason for eyelashes. But notice the uncertain terms they still use. Surprisingly, the real reason eyelashes evolved has remained unknown. Research shows that those who lack lashes, which some do, suffer higher than average rates of eye infection. That suggests they have some sort of protective function. But exactly what this is and how it works has been a mystery. Some people hypothesize that lashes protect eyes from falling dust. Others think that they act rather like an animal's whiskers, detecting foreign bodies before they can do harm and triggering a protective blink. David Hugh of the Georgia Institute of Technology and his colleagues think they have cracked the problem. Eyelashes do not protect eyes directly. Rather, they change the flow of air around the eye in ways that stop dust and other irritants getting in and moisture getting out. The next excerpt shows God's genius in thinking through each detail. The crucial observation that led Dr. Hugh to this conclusion was that no matter what species of mammal he examined, and he studied 22, the length of its lashes was on average a third of the width of its eye. Scientists conducted an experiment to test their theory and discovered nature has, it turns out, arrived at the optimum eyelash length to keep the cornea moist and dust free. Of course, no mention of God, just nature did this. By reducing airflow over the cornea, eyelashes create a boundary layer of slow-moving air. That stops dust getting through and also promotes water retention since moisture is not blown away. Up to a point, the boundary layer grows thicker as the lashes grow longer. But long lashes also act as a funnel, channeling moving air into the eye and disrupting the protective layer. The thickest boundary layer comes when there is a 1 to 3 ratio between lash length and eye width. Their main job, if Dr. Hugh is right, is to be a windbreak. Next comes a tiny, little-known creature, the Australian termite. This particular termite differs from all others. In fact, it's four creatures in one. Each depends on the others for continued existence, where you cannot have one without all the others. Let's see. A curiosity I studied in microbiology class was a microorganism called Myxotrica paradoxa that lives in the gut of Australian termites. When it was first discovered, it looked as if it was covered with a bunch of curly hairs. Looking closer, it was revealed that these were not hairs at all, but spirochetes, a totally different type of microorganism. On the myxotrica, there were bumps or appendages where the spirochetes attached, and bacillus, which lodged on the other side of the bump. The spirochetes provide a means of locomotion for the entire colony of microorganisms. They are three totally different germs that decided to live together in a community. So, what you have is an interdependence between a large microorganism, a spirochete, a bacillus, an Australian termite, and even the trees the termites feed upon. I suppose if you're an evolutionist, you would have to believe that at one point in time they formed a committee and decided to all work together. The myxotrica developing bumps where the spirochetes could burrow their heads and behind which the bacillus could hide, all of whom decided to live in the gut of a termite. Interdependence and ecology are problems for evolutionists. These principles demonstrate there are delicate balances between all of the different species on the earth and that each is dependent on the other. Which evolved first, a species or the food it feeds upon? And to think creationists are always depicted as having blind faith and illogic. So obviously, this proves special creation of all four creatures at the same time. They could not have developed separately and survived to eventually rendezvous for interdependent existence. 
Next comes the unique relationship between koala bears and eucalyptus trees. Both are only native to Australia. Koalas eat nothing but eucalyptus leaves, often living their entire lives in one grove. They also derive moisture from these leaves because they almost never drink water. Koalas possess specific microorganisms in their digestive systems required to break down elements in eucalyptus leaves that are toxic to all other creatures. These toxins actually convert into vitamins. How did koalas evolve unless they were created with these microorganisms already present in their stomachs? Otherwise, they would have eaten the leaves and died. Yet their systems are so specific, they can only survive on these leaves. Naturalists consider them to have the most advanced digestive system on Earth. A low 5% protein intake plus tannins and toxins would kill other animals. Sadly, rejecting creation by God, evolutionists must conclude what luck for koalas that just the right microorganisms entered their system at the exact same time they developed a taste for only eucalyptus leaves. No, this proves God created koalas. God rejecting evolutionists have no excuse for disbelief. The next amazing quote demonstrates the impossibility of whales and dolphins evolving. It lies in context with a larger statement about why there is no fossil record showing what would have to be almost endless transitions of development. We can demonstrate one such transition problem by using the example of dolphins and whales. These mammals bear their young alive and breathe air, yet spend their entire lifetime in the sea. Presumably, in order for dolphins and whales to have evolved, they must have originated from a land mammal that returned to the water and changed into a sea creature. But dolphins and whales have so many remarkable features upon which their survival depends that they couldn't have evolved. It would be a lot like trying to change a bus into a submarine one part at a time, all while it is traveling at 60 miles per hour. The following is a list of transitions evolutionists have to account for in the dolphin in its evolution from some unknown land-dwelling pre-dolphin. One, the nose would have to move to the back of the head. Two, feet, claws, and tail would be exchanged for fins and flippers. Three, it would have to develop a torpedo-shaped body for efficient swimming in the water. Four, it would have to be able to drink seawater and desalinize it. Five, its entire bone structure and metabolism would have to be rearranged. Six, it would need to develop a sophisticated sonar system to search for food. Could the dolphin acquire these features gradually, one at a time, over millions of years? What about the transitional stages? Would they have survived with just some of these features? Why is there a total absence of transitional forms fossilized? Consider the whale and its enormous size in comparison with the plankton it feeds upon. The whale is a nautical vacuum cleaner with a baleen filter. While it was developing this feature, what did it feed upon before? For me, it takes a great stretch of the imagination to picture the evolution of dolphins and whales. End of quote. It must be concluded both were created. Any overview of birds reveals remarkable facts. Nearly every kind builds its nest differently. Courtship behavior, sexual roles, and reproductive activity vary among almost every species. In one bird, females gather food while males tend the eggs. And when did the sexes diverge for birds or any other animal? Even some plants are male and female. How did this happen? Hummingbirds represent true creative genius. They weigh one-fourteenth of an ounce and, like helicopters, can fly forward, backward, sideways, or hover. Their flight mechanism is incredibly complex, and the quills in their feathers are stronger for their weight than any structure ever designed by man. These quills constantly change shape to adjust for wind and air pressure. The leading vein of their feather functions like a propeller for lift and propulsion. Think, three-quarters of their entire weight are wing muscles. 
They possess a kind of jet-assisted mechanism for landings and takeoffs. Air flows only one way into their lungs to bring a constant supply of oxygen for strenuous high-speed flight. They also have retractable landing gear, a migration navigation system, streamlining, camouflage, and an extraordinary respiration system that stores extra air inside their hollow bones. This also provides buoyancy in an internal air conditioner. Hummingbirds must eat continually to satisfy their high metabolism. Stopping would mean death. Only through a kind of hibernation at night can they survive. Could all of this have evolved or just happened? Like bumblebees, which also appear to completely defy the laws of physics and flying ability, the hummingbird is just as unique but even closer to aerodynamic perfection. Only God could have made such an efficient flying machine. No aeronautical engineer has ever designed anything close to this tiny marvel of flight. The anglerfish, archerfish, and anableps all literally swim in the face of evolution. The female angler has a lure hanging from an appendage on her nose. It attracts fish so she can strike and swallow them. The male does not have one because he never eats. Rather, he attaches himself to the female, allowing their bloodstreams to merge, thus feeding him. Evolutionists have no explanation for anglerfish. The archerfish can shoot down bugs above the surface by squirting. Water severely bends or refracts light and should cause an impossible targeting problem for the fish. It is score or starve. How do all archerfish instinctively know how to perfectly compute the angle of light refraction to successfully hit prey? God built it in. The anableps has extraordinary eyes. It sits on the surface, seeing out of water and underwater at the same time. Its eyes are divided into two parts. How did evolution cause half an eye to gradually evolve to see out of water and the other half underwater? Ridiculous. What engineer has ever made such efficient submarines whose design makes them perfect hunters, so well suited for their needs and environment? More scientists accept that the overwhelming evidence of design all around us requires a great designer and acceptance of any other explanation denies reality. The first quote sets up the second. Everyone concludes naturally and comfortably that highly ordered and designed items, machines, houses, etc., owe existence to a designer. It is unnatural to conclude otherwise. But evolution asks us to break stride from what is natural to believe and then believe in that which is unnatural, unreasonable, and unbelievable. The author later writes, The basis for this departure from what is natural and reasonable to believe is not fact, observation, or experience, but rather unreasonable extrapolations from abstract probabilities, mathematics, and philosophy. Now the second source. In concluding, it is important to realize we are not inferring design from what we do not know, but from what we do know. We are not inferring design to account for a black box, but to account for an open box. A man from a primitive culture who sees an automobile might guess that it was powered by the wind or an antelope hidden under the car. But when he opens the hood and sees the engine, he immediately realizes it was designed. In the same way, biochemistry has opened the cell to examine what makes it run, and we see that it, too, was designed designed. It was a shock to people of the 19th century when they discovered from observations science had made that many features of the biological world could be ascribed to natural selection. It is a shock to us in the 20th century to discover from observations science has made that the fundamental mechanisms of life cannot be ascribed to natural selection and therefore were designed. But we must deal with our shock as best we can and go on. The theory of undirected evolution is already dead, but the work of science continues. End of quote. Remember, true science always harmonizes with the facts, all of them. 
Believers in God or creation need never fear the facts of science. This author concluded by implying there is directed evolution, often called theistic evolution, meaning God directed the gradual process of all things evolving. Many like to declare, I believe in God, I just think evolution was his method of choice. This introduces a truly great question. Can Christians accept evolution? Is this compatible with the Bible and following Jesus Christ? What does the New Testament say? What did Christ say? I will answer these questions in detail following this series. Look for Can a Christian Believe Evolution? You will be shocked. The facts of science led two world-famous scientists to see an intelligent designer behind the complexity of the universe. The brilliant Albert Einstein admitted, Everyone who is seriously involved in the pursuit of science becomes convinced that some spirit is manifest in the laws of the universe, one that is vastly superior to that of man. In this way, the pursuit of science leads to a religious feeling of a special sort, he said. Dr. Werner von Braun, the rocket scientist and father of American space program, declared, I find it is difficult to understand a scientist who does not acknowledge the presence of a superior rationality behind the existence of the universe as it is to comprehend a theologian who would deny the advance of science. Of course, again, honest theologians would never deny science. The author of science, God, would certainly not be in conflict with what he authored. Now let's take an imaginary trip to the moon and look back at Earth. Consider all we left behind. Let's ask, what are the mathematical odds that the Earth, with all its plants, animals, ecosystems, and complex interdependence, could come into existence by itself? What are the actual odds all this could happen, that even one Earth could occur? Numerous scientists have recognized the improbable position of our planet's location in the solar system relative to its moon. For instance, if the Earth were 10% farther from the sun, it would freeze over. If 10% closer, it would quickly bake. If 20% closer to the moon, 35 to 50 foot tidal waves would twice a day engulf most of Earth's land surface at great speed. Dr. Hugh Ross sat down and carefully performed an extraordinarily complex mathematical computation. He took 123 separate parameters, realized that today there are over 200, and calculated the odds that all these 123 factors necessary for the Earth to exist as we know it could have come together, just happened, on their own. A few must be listed to appreciate the complexity of his calculations. Ross computed an exact value for galaxy size, type, location, birth date of its sun, proximity of solar nebula to a supernova eruption, number of moons, mass and distance from moons, tidal force, axis tilt of planet, distance from star, global distribution of continents, thickness of planet crust, atmospheric transparency, pressure, Viscosity, carbon dioxide level, amount of chlorine, cobalt, copper, fluorine, nickel, potassium, and many other elements in the Earth's crust, oxygen to nitrogen ratio, volcanic activity, and 99 more. He then performed one final computation before arriving at a conclusion on the chances of the entire universe producing even one Earth. His calculation for finding all 123 parameters for a single Earth? Less than one chance in 10 to the 139th power. 100 million trillion 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 11 trillions, a lot of zeros, exist that even one such planet would occur anywhere in the universe. End of quote. A Vigentillion, for a long time the largest known number, has 63 zeros. But the odds of one Earth anywhere in the universe involves a number so immensely large as to absolutely dwarf a Vigentillion. Understand, 
The universe is inseparable from the laws of mathematics. Any mathematician worth his salt would admit the earth was created exactly as we see it. So then, the universe was created by God. Let's at least pause to ask, why are people, maybe including you, willing to believe the proof that God created the heavens and the earth as he said, but not willing to believe he created all life on earth, plants and animals, as he said? Make yourself see and come to grips with this inconsistency. Now, don't miss the final two parts of this vital series. Until next time, this is David C. Pack saying goodbye, friends. This program was made available by Restored Church of God members and donors from around the globe. Explore our vast library of literature and other World to Come programs, which are all made available free of charge. To order literature featured in this program, call toll-free 1-855-828-4646. That number again, 1-855-828-4646. This series has been answering the question, does God exist? We have already examined many scientific facts, quotes, and stunning evidence from the natural world that proves a master creator designed all we see around us. But there is more to learn. Part 4 looks more closely at how true science in no way disproves God. We will also see how evolutionists get away with presenting their theories as established facts along with the changing scenarios scientists use to explain how life came to be. Watch to the end. Quoting is done more than other broadcasts because we now bring additional proof showing scientists in their own words explaining why the existence of a God is necessary. Why there being no God is entirely implausible, literally not possible. The World to Come The Restored Church of God presents David C. Pack, author of 80 books and booklets, editor-in-chief of The Real Truth magazine, read by countless and growing numbers in every nation and territory of the world. In a violent age full of war, famine, pollution, disease, disasters, and economic uncertainty, and ever-worsening bad news, Answering life's greatest questions straight from the Bible and announcing the wonderful good news of the world to come. And now, David C. Pack. First, let's look more in depth at how evolutionists get away with presenting their theory as established fact. Writers, lecturers, and television programs on evolution use a variety of deceptive tricks, wittingly or unwittingly, to sell their audience what is unproven and unprovable. Creation logic is mocked and replaced by bald illogic. Theories are professed with no more than suggested proof, and sometimes not even this. Fascinating truths are woven toward whatever false conclusion is needed. Important history and figures are used to support mere conjecture. Powerful music sometimes stirs emotions to glorious heights of association with supposed truth. Compelling language is used in scripting of outcome to sell nonsensical drivel. Poetic rhythm is often employed with utter gibberish repeated over and over until the viewer or reader has almost no choice but to collapse and accept pure fiction as fact. Foolish comparisons are sprinkled throughout. Marvelous visible wonders are connected to opinions. Powerful graphics are shown, but also based on complete fiction, like bone fragments being presented as part of the evolutionary fossil record when no such record exists. Facts are tied to confusing, mystical statements that breed acceptance. Near impossible probabilities are just ignored. Utterly impossible conclusions are presented for belief by simple assertion. Scientific terms are oft spoken and used to mean whatever evolutionists need them to. Misleading anti-Bible statements are used, such as matter obeyed commands we could discover, laws the Bible hadn't mentioned. 
I've even seen cartoon characters speak incredibly shallow commentary to drive a completely false point. Outright silliness is given and received as science merely because it is said with a straight face. And simple imagination is passed off as scientific certainty. Sadly, anti-creationists constantly denigrate any idea of creation by any means possible. Terrible bias blinds them. However sincere, scientists who were taught to reject the Creator's revealed instruction book present far-fetched theories about the beginning of all things. A quote describes how all humans, animals, and plants supposedly sprang from nothing. If you compress all the time since the Big Bang, the explosive birth of the universe, into a single Earth year, a billion years is about one month of that year. What was happening on Earth a billion years ago? Most of Earth's land was amassed into a supercontinent called Rodinia. It was a barren desert. No animals, no plants, single-celled organisms dominated the oceans. This is pure opinion that is now broadly challenged. But some existed in colonies called microbial mats, and the first multicellular organisms would soon evolve. Again, simple opinion, supposition presented with authority. This show concluded suggesting viewers not let ignorant, fanatical religionists confuse them. We continue. Have scientists known sin? Of course. We have misused science, just as we have every other tool at our disposal. The leap of logic begins here, and that's why we can't afford to leave it in the hands of a powerful few, unless they're scientists. The more science belongs to all of us, the less likely it is to be misused, meaning by religionists. These values undermine the appeals of fanaticism and ignorance. And, after all, the universe is mostly dark, guided by islands of light, learning the age of the earth or the distance to the stars, or how life evolves because it matters what's true, and our imagination is nothing compared to nature's awesome reality. I want to know what lies beyond the cosmic horizon and how life began. But the great God tells us. We've begun to learn the story of our origins, star stuff, contemplating the evolution of matter. But you have seen matter cannot evolve, that this is impossible. Tracing that long path by which it arrived at consciousness, we and the other living things on this planet carry a legacy of cosmic evolution spanning billions of years. If we come to know and love nature as it really is, then we will surely be remembered by our descendants as good, strong links in the chain of life. Obviously very sincere, but just as sincerely wrong. Millions are now embarrassed to admit belief in God, but especially the Genesis creation account. Yet scenarios of how life supposedly began continue to change. This is from a book review. Most people learn some version of the primordial soup theory, which posits that Earth's early oceans contained enough organic chemicals to form spontaneously some kind of primitive self-replicator. But biology has moved on, and Mr. Lane, the author, gives a convincing account, based on basic chemical principles, of why this theory is almost certainly wrong. There is simply not enough energy available in such a system to produce complicated chemicals at anything like the required rate. Mr. Lane's preferred idea is that life got its start in warm vents at the bottom of the ocean, in which hot, mineral-infused water wells up from beneath the seafloor. As the water cools, the minerals precipitate out forming intricate, honeycombed structures. These tiny mineral chambers provided an early version of the modern cell wall. You can just hear the music in the background of this classic opinion given as fact. They kept the chemistry inside the cell different from that outside. Who says? That, in turn, allowed the formation of a strong voltage gradient across their boundaries. The opinion necessarily must grow. Those gradients were the forerunners of the voltage differences that enable modern cells to manufacture the thousands of chemicals they need to function. What? And which therefore provide the vital spark 
for every living thing on the planet. Let's return to examining the incredible complexity of life on Earth. In part three, we saw the intricacy of the human eye. And the more mankind learns about how the human body functions, we must ask, how could it possibly have just evolved? The very nose on your face brings this question smashing into it. How is it that your nose can smell one or more odors or fragrances and know within a split second what they are? Let's understand the human sense of smell. How does a nose bombarded with odors that arrive in different amounts and combinations consistently identify each aroma? It can essentially be broken down into a predictable mathematical pattern. Odors arrive in small packets, tiny bouquets of molecules that are inhaled. Receptor cells inside the nose respond by producing a series of electrical spikes, which are communicated to the olfactory bulb in the brain, where the smell is decoded. It's like Morse code, said a professor of neurobiology, supervisor of a recent study about the olfactory system that is the first to document the coding is linear. The pattern and spacing of the clicks make different letters. The pattern of the electrical spikes translates to specific smells. But significantly, when the smell is repeated in the same dose, the pattern remains the same. And when the odor varies in duration, the neuron's electrical response changes proportionately. In other words, the response is orderly and predictable rather than chaotic and irregular. And dumb evolution did this? Dr. Werner von Braun, recall he was the father of the American space program, saw that complexity of design throughout nature and the universe pointed to a great designer. Consider this extensive insight. For me, the idea of a creation is not conceivable without invoking the necessity of design. One cannot be exposed to the law and order of the universe without concluding that there must be design and purpose behind it all. In the world around us, we can behold the obvious manifestations of an ordered, structured plan or design. We can see the will of the species to live and propagate, and we are humbled by the powerful forces at work on a galactic scale and the purposeful orderliness of nature that endows a tiny and ungainly seed with the ability to develop into a beautiful flower. The better we understand the intricacies of the universe and all it harbors, the more reason we have found to marvel at the inherent design upon which it is based. While the admission of a design for the universe ultimately raises the question of a designer, a subject outside science, the scientific method does not allow us to exclude data which lead to the conclusion that the universe, life, and man are based on design. To be forced to believe only one conclusion, that everything in the universe happened by chance, would violate the very objectivity of science itself. Certainly there are those who argue the universe evolved out of a random process. But what random process could produce the brain of a man or the system of the human eye? Some people say that science has been unable to prove the existence of a designer. They admit that many of the miracles in the world around us are hard to understand, and they do not deny that the universe is indeed a far more wondrous thing than the creation medieval man could perceive. But they still maintain that since science has provided us with so many answers, the day will soon arrive when we will be able to understand even the creation of the fundamental laws of nature without a divine intent. They challenge science to prove the existence of God, but must we really light a candle to see the sun? Many men who are intelligent of good faith say they cannot visualize a designer. Well, can a physicist visualize an electron? The electron is materially inconceivable, and yet it is so perfectly known through its effects that we use it to illuminate our cities, guide our airliners through the night skies, and take the most accurate measurements. What strange rationale makes some physicists accept the inconceivable electron as real while refusing to accept the reality of a designer on the ground that they cannot conceive him? 
I have discussed the aspect of a designer at some length because it might be that the primary resistance to acknowledging the case for design as a viable scientific alternative to the current case for chance lies in the inconceivability in some scientists' minds of a designer. We in NASA were often asked what the real reason was for the amazing string of successes we had with Apollo flights to the moon. I think the only honest answer we could give was that we tried to never overlook anything. It is in the same sense of scientific honesty that I endorse the presentation of alternative theories for the origin of the universe, life, and man in the science classroom. It would be an error to overlook the possibility that the universe was planned rather than happening by chance." End of quote. While this series has made plain that planning is far more than a possibility, one could wish for more such honest science. In fact, most scientists do not want you reading these kinds of other scientists. The World to Come program will return after this brief message. Be sure to regularly view The World to Come. It is unlike anything you've seen before. The subject of this broadcast is only one of the many biblical topics that are misunderstood and misinterpreted by modern Christianity. The law of God, the origin of traditional holidays, salvation, heaven, hell, and the purpose of the family, the Sabbath, real faith, proper baptism, true conversion, financial laws, and numerous others are covered on this program. On the world to come, you will hear the plain truth of these subjects and many more. You will also hear world news examined in the light of Bible prophecy, its biggest elements made easy to understand. Tune in for every broadcast. And now, back to David C. Pack. The next quote is beyond fascinating. The longest quote in the whole series, it comes from a Time Magazine article, Why Science Does Not Disprove God, and shows more evidence God's existence in no way conflicts with science. It begins, A number of recent books and articles would have you believe that somehow science has now disproved the existence of God. We know so much about how the universe works, their authors claim, that God is simply unnecessary. We can explain all the workings of the universe without the need for a creator. And indeed, science has brought us an immense amount of understanding. But does this vast knowledge base disprove the existence of some kind of pre-existent outside force that may have launched our universe on its way? Science is an amazing, wonderful undertaking. It teaches us about life the world and the universe, but it has not revealed why the universe came into existence, nor what preceded its birth in the Big Bang. Biological evolution has not brought us the slightest understanding of how the first living organisms emerged from inanimate matter on this planet, and how the advanced eukaryotic cells, the highly structured building blocks of advanced life forms, ever emerged from simpler organisms. Neither does it explain one of the greatest mysteries of science. How did consciousness arise in living things? What is it that allows humans to understand the mysteries of biology, physics, mathematics, engineering, and medicine? And what enables us to create great works of art, music, architecture, and literature? Science is nowhere near explaining these deep mysteries. We will send you a free booklet answering these questions. Titled, What Science Will Never Discover About Your Mind, it addresses every question you have about why you have a mind that can think and create, and animals merely have brains that function on instinct. We continue the quote. But much more important than these conundrums is the persistent question of the fine-tuning of the parameters of the universe. Why is our universe so precisely tailor-made for the emergence of life? This question has never been answered satisfactorily. The deeper we delve into the mysteries of physics and cosmology, the more the universe appears to be intricate and incredibly complex. To explain the quantum mechanical behavior of even one tiny particle requires pages and pages of extremely advanced mathematics. Why are even the tiniest particles of matter so unbelievably complicated? 
It appears that there is a vast hidden wisdom or structure or naughty blueprint for even the most simple looking element of nature. And the situation becomes much more daunting as we expand our view to the entire cosmos. The next section is even more fascinating. Follow it carefully. We know that 13.7 billion years ago, a gargantuan burst of energy, whose nature and source are completely unknown to us and not in the least understood by science, initiated the creation of our universe. Then suddenly, as if by magic, the God particle, the Higgs boson, discovered two years ago, came into being and miraculously gave the universe its mass. Why did this happen? The mass constituted elementary particles, the quarks and the electron, whose weights and electrical charges had to fall within immeasurably tight bounds for what would happen next. For from within the primeval soup of elementary particles that constituted the young universe, again, as if by a magic hand, the quarks suddenly bunched in threes to form protons and neutrons, their electrical charges set precisely to the exact level needed to attract and capture the electrons, which then began to circle nuclei made of the protons and neutrons. All of the masses, charges, and forces of interaction in the universe had to be in just the precisely needed amount so that early light atoms could form. Eventually, the highly complicated double helix molecule, the life-propagating DNA, would be formed. Are you grasping all of this? Why did everything we need to exist come into being? How was all of this possible without some latent outside power to orchestrate the precise dance of elementary particles required for the creation of all the essentials of life? The great British mathematician Roger Penrose has calculated, based on only one of the hundreds of parameters of the physical universe, that the probability of the emergence of a life-giving cosmos was, get this, 1 divided by 10 raised to the power of 10 and again raised to the power of 123. This is a number as close to zero as anyone has ever imagined. The probability is much, much smaller than that of winning the Mega Millions jackpot for more days than the 13.7 billion year old universe has been in existence. The scientific atheists have scrambled to explain this troubling mystery by suggesting the existence of a multiverse, an infinite set of universes, each with its own parameters. But if it takes an immense power of nature to create one universe, then how much more powerful would that force have to be in order to create infinitely many universes? So the purely hypothetical multiverse, to begin with, does not solve the problem of God. The incredible fine-tuning of the universe presents the most powerful argument for the existence of an imminent creative entity we may well call God. With all that we have examined, why are there not more scientists coming out in support of God's existence? A chief reason, there are others we will discuss later, that many will not acknowledge God's existence is because it also would be a change of religion for them, literally. Think. Most people cling at all costs to long-held beliefs, with this stubbornness more applicable to religious beliefs than any others. Atheism and evolution are religions to vast millions, something they consider to be personal, matters of faith not to be contested. Don't try. I repeat, this series is for the open-minded, hopefully you, not them. Let's see why so many atheists and evolutionists live in a world of frustration and disillusionment. It reveals a great truth. Finding a distinct beginning to the universe was something that most scientists did not anticipate and which made most of them, like Einstein, enormously uncomfortable. There is a kind of religion in science, says Jastro, a famous scientist. It is the religion of a person who believes there is order and harmony in the universe, and every event can be explained in a rational way as the product of some previous event. Every effect must have its cause. There is no first cause, but here it was, a first effect. The universe, most astronomers and physicists now agree, had a distinct beginning. There, therefore, must be a first cause, a prime mover, 
God that set the universe in motion. For the scientist who has lived by his faith in the mountains of ignorance, he is about to conquer the highest peak. As he pulls himself over the final rock, he is greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries. How sad that so many scientists seem to receive the knowledge of God's existence as a setback or defeat to be overcome rather than joyfully accepting it as the biggest answer among life's greatest questions. A brief inset. While a subject for another time, at least realize the universe and Earth are not 6,000 years old as some claim. This comes from misunderstanding the Genesis account which leads many to lose confidence in the arguments of creationists. Let's learn the truth. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Verse 1 describes when God created everything. It is straightforward, and nearly all translations render it the same. The true God is a perfect being. He always creates for a purpose. Consider his description of when the heavens and earth were created. Thus says the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it. He has established it. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. The Hebrew for vain means a desolation, desert, a worthless thing without form, nothing, waste, or wilderness. The heavens and earth were created for immediate habitation, obviously not a worthless thing without form. Most never hear how the pre-Adamic world was populated by giant prehistoric creatures. This was a time of prehistory, as far as man is concerned. Men were created later, after the time Satan ruled the earth as Lucifer with his one-third of the angels, now demons. Men came after the time of their rebellion. Dinosaurs of all kinds, as well as animals like giant reptiles, inhabited earth. Now Genesis 1-2. Without form comes from tohu, the same as vain in Isaiah 45-18. Void comes from bohu, meaning a vacuity, a total emptiness of matter, a vacuum, an undistinguishable ruin. This is exactly what God said he did not create. He is not the author of confusion, rather doing everything decently and in order. The Hebrew Haya makes this crystal clear. Incorrectly translated was, in Genesis 1-2, a proper rendering is became or came to be. So the most accurate translation of verse 2 is, the earth became desolate, a worthless thing in an undistinguishable ruin. Let's summarize. Genesis 1-1 describes God creating the entire universe. Satan's rebellion occurred at some point between verses 1 and 2. Because they had failed to overthrow their creator, the devil and his demons, like spoiled children who could not get their own way, wrecked the face of the earth. Earthquakes and volcanoes shattered the planet, causing geological mayhem. Poisonous gases filled the atmosphere, choking everything that breathed and shutting out sunlight. Oceans overflowed Earth's surface until the whole planet was covered with water. All life, dinosaurs, plants, insects, and other creatures, was destroyed. Verses 1 and 2 describe vastly different times and events. Verse 2 describes Earth's recreation. Young Earth creationists correctly date this to about 6,000 years ago. But Earth has existed for billions of years. Only very recently did God renew, recreate it for the first human beings, Adam and Eve. Not human interpretation, this is the Bible interpreting itself, which is one of the 12 great rules of Bible study. When one lets the Bible tell him what the Bible means and properly uses scientific data, the truth of creation is not only understood, but awe-inspiring. Now, don't miss the concluding part five. Until next time, this is David C. Pack saying goodbye, friends. This program was made available by Restored Church of God members and donors from around the globe. Explore our vast library of literature and other World to Come programs, which are all made available free of charge. To order literature featured in this program, 
call toll-free 1-855-828-4646. That number again, 1-855-828-4646. This final part five, Proving God Exists, presents the big picture. This series represents a tiny fraction of all that could be presented. It could easily have been ten parts without exhausting what's available. We will look at what God says in His Word about why so many refuse to believe He exists, at the reason many intelligent scientists and evolutionists remain blind. Again, watch to the end. The World to Come. The Restored Church of God presents David C. Pack, author of 80 books and booklets, editor-in-chief of The Real Truth magazine, read by countless and growing numbers in every nation and territory of the world. In a violent age full of war, famine, pollution, disease, disasters, and economic uncertainty, and ever-worsening bad news, Answering life's greatest questions straight from the Bible and announcing the wonderful good news of the world to come. And now, David C. Pack. World famous astronomer Carl Sagan came to believe God exists, that no other explanation for the universe was possible. A fascinating quote from his book, Pale Blue Dot, written after seeing a picture of Earth taken from Voyager 1, four billion miles away, brings powerful perspective to objective thinkers. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, you know, you ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, Thousands of religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hero and coward, creator and destroyer of civilization, king and peasant, every young couple in love, mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, corrupt politician, superstar, supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species, lived there on a mote of dust suspended in a sunbeam. The earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of this pixel on the scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner. How frequent their misunderstandings, how eager they are to kill one another. How fervent their hatreds. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. Yet the greatest help any could imagine is coming and is just over the horizon. Finally, it has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character-building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. Humbled by facts and reality, Carl Sagan knew God existed. All should ponder his words. Sagan wondered about the origin of all things, but died realizing he never knew the purpose for life. You can, and we will touch on it at the end. Many discuss proofs of God's existence, but none address why intelligent people do not and will not believe he does, no matter what. Evolutionists and atheists are deeply vested in their only alternative to accepting, believing in, and obeying God. Why? God describes those who refuse to accept the mountain of evidence proving his existence. He is strong and blunt. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold, the Greek is hold back, the truth in unrighteousness. 
because that which may be known of God is manifest, obvious in them. For God has showed it unto them. Notice what follows. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. I warned it was strong. Modern science is without excuse when it chooses to believe evolution and chooses to ignore God's existence. You've heard, there is none so blind as he who refuses to see. If people refuse truth, evidence, clear proof of God's existence, it is willful blindness. Remember, God states, the fool is said in his heart, there is no God. God used the Apostle Paul to underscore the real problem. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served the creature, that's creation, and scientists often do, more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. The margin says, void of judgment. God says he gave those who reject him minds void of judgment. They cannot think straight. They can see scientific facts, but cannot come to right conclusions. And you can't get them to. I know, I've tried. They won't bend, but will look at you piteously because you are ignorant. Don't succumb to their scorn. Such people are tragically confused. Choices they made early on caused God to make his own choice about what to do with their minds. The Bible reveals that God did this to them after they elevated themselves and began worshiping their own thinking. Paul describes what this leads to. Also very strong, it reads exactly like the world all around you. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. The Bible teaches the carnal or natural mind is enmity, meaning hostile, against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. This is the natural tendency of all human beings, although most would never believe or admit it without God's help. Here's why. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it or who would believe it? There is no proof, evidence, fact, logic, or sound reasoning that could ever cause anyone who is unwilling to set aside their natural prejudice against believing in and yielding to the authority of a loving God to accept that authority. Innate bias against belief in an all-powerful God who tells them how to live keeps most from admitting the proofs you have seen. An outright hypocrisy adds to why atheists and evolutionists resist the truth. Universities are hotbeds of atheism, where anti-God professors actually persecute students they can't break from believing God exists. And each year they cause thousands who cannot handle the pressure and often public humiliation to collapse into their arms. This is what you can be up against. It's my hope this series will help you and your family survive such attacks. Consider all we've discussed about the universe and its contents. Planets, stars, galaxies, plants, animals, humans, and the human mind. Assume you have all power to create whatever you wish. 
Could you have created this much beauty, majesty, design, size, precision of engineering, and magnificence by yourself with no help from anyone? Remember, you would have no pattern to copy. Could you design one trillion galaxies, each with about a hundred billion stars, with no pattern to copy? Would you think to create light and have it travel 186,000 miles per second? Could you think to make sound move at 660 miles per hour? Could you create every kind of atom known to science, including all subatomic particles in them? Would you then think to merge some atoms into complex molecules, able to serve a myriad of indescribably complicated purposes? Could you design millions of plants, many that are interdependent on each other? Then could you design, again, no pattern to follow, 13 million animals and insects, all perfectly interdependent, but also dependent on the entire plant world? What of all the food for both plants and animals so they would be sustained through whatever time you allotted them to live? I could go on. With 1,000 people helping for 1,000 lifetimes, this could never be done. Be careful. Don't insult yourself or God by believing your mind is a product of dumb luck, by suggesting the whole universe and its contents could just happen to existence entirely by itself. Because ignorant, foolish atheists are willing to believe this, honest, informed people would never believe such folly just because such men say so. The following is God's challenge to all who are lifted with pride. The patriarch Job's friend presents great questions about the creation of earth and the universe and describes God's power and brilliance. God thunders marvelously with his voice. Great things does he which we cannot comprehend. For he says to the snow, be you on the earth, likewise to the small rain and to the great rain of his strength. He seals up the hand of every man that all men may know his work. Then the beasts go into dens and remain in their places. Out of the south comes the whirlwind and cold out of the north. By the breath of God, frost is given and the breadth of the waters is straightened. Hearken, Job, stand still and consider the wondrous works of God. This series has done this. Do you know when God disposed them and caused the light of his cloud to shine? Do you know the balancings of the clouds, the wondrous works of him which is perfect in knowledge? Have you with him spread out the sky, which is strong and is a molten looking glass? Teach us what we shall say unto him, God, for we cannot order our speech by reason of darkness. Concerning the Almighty, we cannot find him out. He is excellent in power and in judgment and in plenty of justice. He will not afflict. Men do therefore fear or obey him. He respects not any that are humanly wise of heart. God said to Job what could be written to atheists or you. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? We call this clouding the issue. Gird up now your loins like a man, for I will demand of you and answer you me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if you have understanding. Who has laid the measures thereof, if you know? Or who has stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? The universe doesn't fly apart. Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars, that's angels, sang together and all the sons of God, again angels, shouted for joy at the time of creation. Or who shut up the sea with doors when it broke forth, as if it had issued out of the womb, when I made the cloud the garment thereof, and thick darkness a swaddling band for it, and broke up for it my decreed place, and set bars and doors, and said, Hitherto shall you come, but no further." And here shall your proud waves be stayed. Have you commanded the morning since your days and caused the day spring to know its place? Have you entered into the springs of the sea? The Bible revealed these thousands of years before men learned of them. Or have you walked in the search of the depth? Have you perceived the breadth of the earth? 
Declare if you know it all. Where is the way where light dwells? And as for darkness, where is the place thereof, that you should take it to the bound thereof, and that you should know the paths to the house thereof? Know you it, because you were then born, or because the number of your days is great? Have you entered into the treasures of the snow? Or have you seen the treasures of the hail, which I have reserved against the time of trouble, against the day of battle and war? By what way is the light parted, which scatters the east wind upon the earth? Who has divided a water course for the overflowing of waters, or a way for the lightning of thunder, to cause it to rain on the earth, where no man is, on the wilderness, wherein there is no man? to satisfy the desolate and waste ground, and to cause the bud of the tender herb to spring forth. Has the rain a father, or who has begotten the drops of dew? Out of whose womb came the ice and the white frost of heaven? Who has gendered it? God then speaks of the entire universe, including constellations. Can you bind the sweet influences of Pleiades, or loose the bands of Orion? Can you bring forth Maseroth in his season? Or can you guide Arcturus with his sons? Know you the ordinances of heaven? Can you set the dominion thereof in the earth? Can you lift up your voice to the clouds that abundance of waters may cover you? Can you send lightnings that they may go and say unto you, Here we are. Who has put wisdom in the inward parts? Or who has given understanding to the human heart? Who can number the clouds in wisdom? Who provides for the raven his food? When his young ones cry unto God, they wander for lack of meat. Does the hawk fly by your wisdom and stretch her wings toward the south? Does the eagle mount up at your command and make her nest on high? She dwells and abides on the rock, upon the crag of the rock and the strong place. From thence she seeks the prey. How interesting that Job concludes his book with, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Job thought he saw God, but learned the painful lesson that he fell far short of this. This long passage shows the vastness and majesty of God's creative genius. Again, be careful suggesting his marvelous universe and its contents could just happen into existence by itself. Some who have accepted evolution have not turned to outright atheism, but, influenced by evolutionary thinking, modern theologians, religionists, and ministers have not honestly explored the subject of God in light of the plain facts from history and scripture. These have professed Christianity, meaning they want to appear to be followers of the God of creation, but these men have not been willing to face the facts about their God. They have not been willing to come to full understanding of the true God, the living God. Then, in succession, millions of their parishioners, also unwilling to explore the facts for themselves, follow these deceived men. They remain duped by dishonest, seductive arguments designed by the God of this world. In their vanity, recall Romans 1.22, they foolishly reject vital knowledge. The result? So many have unnecessarily become darkened, blinded to plain understanding of God. Ask, why is there such widespread confusion and division, such disagreement about God? Why is the subject of God not clear, plain to the common man? The Bible declares God is not the author of confusion. God never wants his servants confused. Why then have so many been willing to accept without question this confusion about God? So many say God just doesn't seem real to me but they seem willing to let him remain this way. Not only do the masses stand in ignorance of life's most important knowledge, including the identity of the true God and correct understanding of the many truths he teaches, most do not appear to care. Billions seem not to want to know, to want to solve the mysteries of God and his word. Strangely, they seem willing to read a mystery book knowing in advance the mystery will not be solved. The single most important knowledge in the universe would be that of the true God. What could be more important than which God one worships? Billions have asked who and what 
is God. This central question has confounded man for millennia. He has still not found the answer. With the explosion of new and different brands of Christianity, confusion about God has not lessened in the modern age. And the so-called great religions of the world have only made it worse. Yet, correctly identifying the true God is the biggest issue towering over everything in life. It is at the core of all that is truth. For those who believe God authored the Bible, Christians, the question comes into sharper focus. Who and what is the God of the Bible? Consider this question. Which would be better? Having correct understanding of every doctrine in the Bible, but having neither true knowledge of nor contact with the God who inspired it? Or having no knowledge of Bible truth except the nature and identity of the true God and contact with him. Consider further, the Bible is filled with scores of truths. The gospel, salvation, baptism, the law, the role of Christ, God's master plan, the purpose of the family, scores of prophetic truths, and many more. Think, if one knew and were worshiping the true God, he would automatically be led into all the right knowledge offered by that God, revealed only to those who have a relationship with him. The true God would not leave one in ignorance about how he was to be worshipped. Knowledge of all truths in his word flows from contact with the right God. Possessing all knowledge would be utterly useless if one were worshipping the wrong God. God must reveal himself to any who come to know him. He must distinguish himself from all other supposed deities. Set aside all personal bias and see if God is revealing himself to you. Let's ask, what is the ultimate difference between the God of the Bible and every other God? How does he differentiate himself from all others? Throughout Scripture, God describes himself as the living God, the eternal, I am that I am, the name in Exodus he told Moses to use before Pharaoh. This God separates himself from all others by saying he is alive, living, meaning all other gods are non-existent or, in a sense, dead. Put another way, the true God states, I am, meaning other gods are not, period. Ask yourself, having now proven God exists, are you worshiping the true God, the God who is alive, or something non-existent and dead, a God who is not? This question towers over all others before you. Think of what's at stake in whether there is a God. If so, would he have a purpose for mankind? Human beings would be left to research and prove what it is. They could no longer hide behind atheism or agnosticism. They would be without excuse if they chose not to pursue why they were born. At some point, most people wonder why they are here. What's the purpose of human life? Yet, like Carl Sagan, they live and die never knowing the truth, or even that they could have known. A deceived world has been kept from knowing the vital missing dimension to resolving all mankind's problems. Scientists, theologians, educators, and philosophers have remained ignorant of the truth of why man exists. And yet this awesome truth, this amazing knowledge has always been available but most have not known where to look. This is revealed knowledge, unattainable to all whom God has not called to learn his truth. Realize that disproving evolution automatically proves God's existence. In light of intolerance disguised as political correctness, let's ask, how soon before bringing the facts, the truth of God's existence or his creation, which necessarily debunks evolution and atheism, is called politically incorrect and intolerant hate speech, all while scorners who outright attack God's existence and thus God himself, as well as his creation account and creationists, are deemed open-minded and enlightened. But... Despite persecution, we never fear, nor should you, scoffers who don't fear God and reject all proofs that he exists. We do fear for them. 
God will soon prove to all mankind that he exists by supernaturally intervening in world affairs. He will demonstrate this to the entire world in awesome ways. Before the end time is over, no one on earth will be an atheist. Incredible miracles done by God and the devil's servants will remove all doubt. Ask, what if God revealed in advance what he plans to do? Would you not do everything in your power to secure that knowledge firmly in mind so you are ready when he does? Or would you rather be blindsided by this great God, willing to roll the dice that maybe he does not exist if you just say so? To those who choose the latter, the greatest events in history will slam into them with incomprehensible force. If you choose not to know, remember this was your choice. You knew exactly what you did. A final all-important question arises. Which is worse? Atheists who refuse to admit God exists and he calls fools, or those who do accept God exists but do not diligently seek him. The Bible says he that comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Jesus said, ask, seek, and knock. For everyone that asks receives, and he that seeks finds, and to him that knocks it shall be opened. The Bible contains God's instruction to mankind. He expects those willing to read it to prove all things hold fast that which is good, or the margin says right. Surely God would not expect that we assume his existence but prove everything else from his word. Read our free booklets, Does God Exist? and Bible Authority, Can It Be Proven? Also, our free book, The Awesome Potential of Man, explains God's master plan for you and all mankind. Do not miss the next broadcast answering, Can a Christian Believe Evolution? It will change you. This series has not been a mere case for God or a case against evolution. With irrefutable, undeniable proof, you have seen both atheism and evolution exposed and destroyed as fictions created by men who refuse to obey God. Winston Churchill said, Men occasionally stumble over the truth, but most pick themselves up and hurry off as if nothing ever happened. You have heard truth. In fact, what truth could be greater? Through reason, science, plain logic, and scripture, we have absolute proof that only a being of supreme intelligence could stand as designer and architect of the universe with all its complex life, including the pinnacle, the human mind. Now, what will your mind do with so much undeniable proof? Until next time, this is David C. Pack saying, Goodbye, friends. This program was made available by Restored Church of God members and donors from around the globe. Explore our vast library of literature and other world-to-come programs, which are all made available free of charge. To order literature featured in this program, call toll-free 1-855-828-4646. That number again. 1-855-828-4646.